everyone. My name is David Ciccone. I'm an assistant professor of political science at George Washington University, as well as a faculty associate at the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, which is co-sponsoring this event with the Illiberalism Studies Program. We're really excited to have David Lewis come to come and uh, share his thoughts on his new book, Russia's New Authoritarianism, Putin and the Politics of Order. David Lewis is Associate Professor of International Relations in the Department of Politics at the University of Exeter. Before joining the University of Exeter, he held academic posts in the Department of Peace Studies, University of Bradford, and worked for the International Crisis Group in Central Asia and Sri Lanka. He's written extensively on politics and security in Russia, Central Asia, and the Caucasus, and on different aspects of international relations and peace and conflict studies. He's currently on part-time secondment as an ESRC AHRC Research Fellow at the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office in London. We're delighted to have him for the next hour. And David's going to kick off this session with about 20 minutes of remark, or say 15 minutes of remarks on his book. And we'll jump right into question and answer. So please, you can either chat me directly or use the Q&A function in WebEx to send your questions to me. I will moderate them and pass them on to David, and we can try to use as much time as possible out of this hour for a conversation with the author, um, where that'll be more enjoyable and instructive for everyone who's participating. So we've got a great group and a large audience, and we're just excited to, to hear what David has to say. So David, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you um, and look forward to, to conversing with you in a couple minutes. Thanks so much, David. I uh, hope everyone can hear me OK. Um, I am also very pleased to join you, uh, at least virtually, and uh, it's great to be um, part of this very interesting illiberal, uh, illiberalism studies program, which I recommend people look at on the website, some great materials up there. Um, and I think it's really overdue focus on uh, the ideological aspects of uh, authoritarianism and populism. Um, as David mentioned, I'm on part-time secondment to government at the moment. Obviously, today I'm speaking purely as um, an academic and uh, talking through my new book and trying to understand a little bit about what Putin Putinism is, whether it really is an ism, um, and what Russian authoritarianism uh, is all about. So I'll, I'll run through a few of the key points, I think, um, but I'd really appreciate um, a more interactive session where we can get some questions and answers going as well. So the book is uh, really an attempt to explore what you might call the ideological roots of Putinism. Um, and you know, like all academic book books, it starts off with, with a little bit of critique of other approaches. Part of the reason I started thinking about authoritarianism and Putinism in this kind of way was a certain amount of dissatisfaction with some of the broad uh, theoretical approaches out there in the literature, and particularly the approaches you see uh, often among um, in policy and sort of think tank uh, reporting. And there are three uh, sort of key approaches that I want to sort of move on from, even though each of them have a lot of validity and partial truth. The first one was uh, was this sort of general democratization thesis that suggested that um, Russia was uh, a growing democracy in the 1990s. Uh, that it became authoritarian, as it were, under Putin, and that we should measure Russia essentially in terms of what it lacks. In other words, all the democratic features uh, that it fails to offer. Um, still plenty of Russian politics textbooks around, I think, that, that have those nice chapters, right, on uh, political parties and elections uh, and the legislative process, and simply describe how, uh, how far short Russia has fallen from uh, democratic ideals. And of course, that's all valid. Um, but I think it underestimates the extent to which an alternative, different type of political system has been built and constructed in Russia, and therefore focuses our attention away from the way the system actually works in practice. In other words, how does real live uh, Russian authoritarianism actually function, and why does it function in this particular way? And also, a second point which is why did Russia's leaders think that this was the appropriate political system, system to build? What were the ideological uh, drivers behind this process, this interesting narrative 
that goes right through from uh, the late 1990s until now, uh, and a regime that's evolved through that time, but in uh, particular parameters that as we can talk about. So that's the first uh, sort of moment of discontent uh, was the extent to which the democratization thesis doesn't really tell us uh, everything we need to know about Russia today. Um, and, uh, you know, it also skews analysis, I think, sometimes by focusing so much on uh, elections, on civil society, political opposition, we sometimes miss the more important dynamics that are going on within the regime itself. And then there's a second uh, sort of framework that uh, I, again, wanted to move on from in this book, and that's the kleptocracy framework. Again, uh, very useful uh, work done within this literature. Uh, Karen Nowish's famous work, for example, or uh, uh, Catherine Belton has a lovely book out this year, I strongly recommend. Uh, but to me, that, that approach that really focuses primarily on the personal financial advantages, advantages of the system doesn't give a full holistic approach to the politics of the system. Again, why, why, why are some decisions made that apparently undermine the financial interests of the elites? Why, um, why run this assertive foreign policy that appears to undermine uh, the, the economics of uh, Russia? Uh, I don't think it gives that explanatory uh, traction that we are looking for. And then thirdly, uh, you know, final one, which is also remains quite popular, I think, um, particularly in the sort of popular understanding of Russia, is the sense of Russia as simply reverting to type, right? That this is uh, historical autocracy, uh, that authoritarianism, um, as Richard Pipes would have had it at one point, simply runs within, if you like, Russian genes. And therefore, it's not surprising that Russia, uh, after a brief period of pluralism, has reverted to some kind of autocratic system. Again, lots of truth in those historical precedents and past dependency um, that plays an important role here. But again, uh, this doesn't really explain why Russia uh, turned towards a more authoritarian system at the beginning of the 2000s. And more importantly, I think it doesn't explain why this happened in the context of a much wider backlash uh, against democracy and liberalism uh, in global politics. So one of the aims of the book was to put Russian authoritarianism within this bigger international context, uh, context of uh, growing authoritarian practices, uh, not just in um, already authoritarian states, if you like, but also among some uh, democracies in the West as well. So trying to find ways of linking Russia back into this bigger context. And to do that, I, uh, I refocus attention really on what I think has been overlooked in our uh, understanding of Russian politics, and that's on the role of ideas. Um, the, uh, obviously, there has been good research on this area. Uh, Marlene Larell coming with us today, but uh, a lot of her work, of course, is incredibly invaluable in our understanding of how, uh, how uh, ideas have played an important role in the evolution of Russian politics. But I think these have been ex exceptions rather than the rule. Um, and so this book is partly a plea to think again about the ideas and even, dare I say it, the ideology, ideology that underpins something that we call Putinism. Now, oddly, of course, um, uh, Putin himself has denied that there is any kind of ideology uh, in the current Russian political system. And it's quite common to hear people say that uh, Russia is a post-ideological political system, right? Um, that uh, Evgeny Minchenko has this quite nice phrase that, you know, because Putin is a Judaist, he has no real ideology. Everything is about opportunity, about quick moves. In other words, he's not a chess, chess player, who would be thinking ahead in this kind of strategic ideological way. If I want to challenge that idea, I want to suggest that there are, um, there is not a codified ideology, of course, as we had in the Soviet period. I think we're rather too hung up on that sense of ideology. We should think a little bit more about ideology um, in a rather lighter sense as a worldview, as a way of understanding events, as a way of interpreting the world. In that sense, I think there is a selection of ideas that are shared among large parts of the Russian elite, um, a, uh, uh, a way of looking at the world that defines certain conce concepts in ways that are very different from the way we define them in the West. And through the book, I work through some of these concepts, ideas such as sovereignty, democracy, um, and under try and understand how they are interpreted in different ways uh, in the lexicon of Russian conservatism and indeed in 
Russian official discourse as well. Uh, and so the, the, sec the second part of the book really is about exploring Russian conservative thought and understanding the evolution of Russian conservatism uh, as an ideological strand, uh, and then trying to work through how that has impacted on uh, the evolution of the Russian policy over the last period. And I do this really partly by focusing on one particular uh, philosopher, and that's the uh, uh, famous or rather infamous um, political, uh, political theorist and jurist, uh, Carl Schmitt. Um, many of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with uh, Carl Schmitt, uh, but for those who are not, um, he was a famous jurist, a uh, famous critic of the Weimar Republic, um, and uh, later a Nazi party member, a defender of the Hitler regime. Um, he eventually fell out with the Nazis, but nevertheless, a lifelong advocate of authoritarian politics and a lifelong critic of liberalism, one of the great uh, anti-liberal theorists of the 20th century. And for lots of reasons that we don't have time to go into now, uh, Schmidt has experienced a remarkable renaissance uh, since his death, uh, both on the left of politics uh, and on the right. Leftists see in Schmidt a great critic of liberal democracy, um, a great critic of uh, US foreign policy in particular, um, and someone who saw through the hypocrisy, if you like, of bourgeois liberal life. Uh, on the right, um, many theorists, particularly in the European New Right, uh, saw Schmidt as an inspiration for a new kind of authoritarian order, um, what was sometimes called a non-fascistic fascism. Uh, in other words, rescuing elements of that German conservative thinking of the interwar period from the Nazi experience and trying to rediscover it for a modern uh, age. So Schmidt, for various reasons, uh, became a very popular philosopher in uh, conservative circles in Russia. Lots of reasons for that. Um, uh, partly his sort of polemical ideas, his style, um, his uh, always impending sense of uh, catastrophe and doom, I think rather appealed to the Russian philosophical conversation of the 1990s and early 2000s. And then secondly, the fact that Schmidt is a great philosopher to be interpreted in ways that you like suit your own political polemic. Um, he is someone who is interpreted in very different ways, depending on where you sit on the political uh, spectrum. And he worked his way through uh, Russian conservatism through several different channels. Um, one of them, the most the crudest, if you like, was through Alexander Dugin, uh, much of whose geopolitical theory is really uh, based uh, not on Eurasianist thought from the 1920s, but on Carl Schmitt's uh, views of geopolitics. Um, but it's quite difficult to talk about uh, Dugin, I think, these days in uh, sort of scholarly circles because of so much exaggeration of his influence uh, in the past. And I should say this, this book is not an attempt to, uh, you know, another one of those attempts to identify Putin's philosopher, for example, or try and understand who is sitting in Putin's brain. Uh, it's not that at all. It's an attempt to understand this much wider discourse uh, around the Kremlin uh, about the way people uh, see the world and why they react to things in particular ways. In other words, it's about a big set of ideas, not about some kind of specific concrete blueprint that politicians might implement. So the other way that, uh, that Schmidt uh, moved into the sort of Russian political consciousness was through a very interesting group of conservative philosophers called the Young Conservatives, um, people like Mikhail Remezov, who discovered Schmidt in the original and started applying him to the Russian realities of the time. And uh, uh, it's very interesting the way they did that. And they found that Schmidt, for all sorts of reasons, um, uh, really appealed to their sense of how Russia was evolving in the late 1990s and early 2000s. The most obvious parallel, of course, and something that's been discussed, discussed quite often, uh, was the uh, affinity with the Weimar Republic, the idea that Russia in the 90s was also on, this, on the verge of collapse and on the verge of catastrophe. So Schmidt had appeared to many of the Russian conservative philosophers, offered a kind of uh, way of thinking about politics that uh, really showed a big affinity with uh, important aspects of Russian political thought. And I'll just, um, I don't want to talk too long, but I just will highlight four important sort of Schmidt's big ideas, if you like, and, and explain how we might understand them working out within uh, the Russian context. So Schmidt's, uh, Schmidt's 
entire oeuvre, if you like, is a critique of liberalism and a critique of pluralism. His, um, his target is liberal democracy, which he sees as not just a hypo hypocritical sham, but also as an unsustainable form of political order. Um, I look, talk a lot about political order in the book, that's why it's in the title, um, and uh, Schmidt also is a kind of prophet of political order, someone who understands um, uh, or, or believes he understands how political order can be constructed. As we'll come on to, I think he's completely wrong on that, uh, but uh, nevertheless, he has this schema which has a political logic to it, which I think comes across in Russian politics as well. So his first big idea, and one, of course, that has been really dominant in Russian thinking, has been the idea of sovereignty. Uh, sovereign power for Schmidt was at the center of any sustainable political order. He had a very specific understanding of what sovereignty was that we can also see in the Putinist understanding of sovereignty and the understanding of sovereignty among Russian conservatives more widely. And that's sovereignty as a monopoly of decision making, um, or as, uh, as Schmidt puts it, the sovereign is one who, uh, who decides upon the exception. In other words, the sovereign is someone who can break the law at will, who can break the rules, can step outside the constitution and take decisions to defend the state in important ways. So the idea of sovereignty is always linked up with this idea of exceptionality as well. And of course, Russia as an authoritarian state is also a state that is full of exceptions. Uh, Richard Sakwa, uh, I remember, wrote that Russia had a culture of exceptionality, and I think that's quite a good way of putting it, uh, that throughout Russian politics, uh, the, the other side of having this centralized sovereign power is you then have all these exceptions that work their, their way through the system. And you can track Putinism, and I do this in various ways through the book, through this sort of history of exceptions made to the rule of law, for example, I have a chapter on uh, the ju judicial system and how uh, you know, the old practices of telephone justice came back under Putin um, and uh, served as a kind of exception to the rule of law that served political purposes. Um, I then go on to look at the annexation of Crimea as the ultimate sort of exception in uh, foreign policy, in other words, an exception to the existing norms and rules uh, of international law, and make the point that you know, Crimea was not just about realist foreign policy or about geopolitics, but was about the assertion of sovereignty. In other words, one of the reasons why Putin uh, decided to go ahead with the annexation of Crimea was not just because of the calculation of cost and benefit, uh, but also um, because in a way it affirmed his, his, uh, his ability to act outside the rules and affirmation, if you like, of being the ultimate sovereign power. So sovereignty and exception go together, which is why uh, the whole Putinist system was about removing the ability to make decisions from other parts of the system, from parliament, from regional governors, from oligarchs, of course, the whole uh, campaign against Khodorkovsky, for example, was again about deciding who can decide in the political system, who has real sovereign power. Uh, Putinists, say, Putinists say it has to be the president um, and uh, no one else can have that kind of decision making power. Uh, we can come on to you know, what that actually looks like in practice, but that's clearly been the thinking throughout uh, Putin's time in office is to retain the freedom of maneuver and the freedom of freedom of, of choice, if you like, the ability to make decisions without being weighed down by all the different aspects of either the legal system or a uh, political opposition as well. Just briefly, the second big uh, idea that Schmidt introduces that I look, look at in the book um, is the idea of how you form a political community. Uh, politics for Schmidt is not about creating the good life, about creating a uh, constructive society around um, uh, common ideas and common principles. It's really about uh, defining your community in terms of enemies. Uh, the distinction, the ultimate political distinction for Schmidt is the division between friends and enemies. In other words, to create a majority in politics, you have to define yourself against the other, against somebody else. And right from the very beginning of conservative thinking in Russia in the 2000s, this uh, obsession with um, what is often called the overwhelming majority of the population, Putin used this phrase time and time again in speeches, uh, is really very present. And Russian conservatives steal this idea from American conservative tradition of uh, the idea of the silent majority, the moral majority, uh, that phrase from the 1980s, which was very popular. Uh, 
and and they go out trying to construct this majority uh, of a so-called Putin majority, not just by uh, appealing to different parts of the population, but also by defining them against other groups. Um, it doesn't really matter who those are. At some point, it's uh, against Chechen separatists, for example. It's uh, deliberately uh, against LGBT um, communities. Uh, and of course, ultimately, it's also against the West. And from that, you get the whole discourse around fifth columns, uh, or indeed sixth or seventh columns. Uh, Russian conservatives like to uh, go through all these different types of fifth column. There's a whole sort of theory of the fifth column there. Um, and defining different people uh, as outside the acceptable community. And that explains to a certain extent the logic of things like the attacks on uh, Boris Nemtsov or the attack on Alexei Navalny. These are people who, uh, in a way, are beyond the pale, they're beyond the, uh, the limits of political community. They've stepped outside the norms of, of what it means. And Putin at various times has sort of philosophized, if you like, about what it means, uh, what is the difference between uh, a political opposition and a fifth column. That, uh, uh, rather nuanced discussion, if you like, about what it means to be either an opponent of the regime or to be a traitor to the regime. And this distinction has been a key one in Russian conservative thought, uh, trying to construct a Russian identity in opposition to something else. Uh, there's a brief moment where this seems to be working, right, in, uh, in the Crimean consensus after March 2014. Uh, but I'd suggest we now see that that is an unsustainable form of unity uh, and is breaking down. Crimean consensus was short-lived, and all the other divides in society, political, social, economic, and so forth, have reasserted themselves, uh, maintaining that unity, as we've seen in uh, the referendum in June, for example, and we will no doubt see in the Duma elections next year. Uh, it's much more difficult, as uh, the ratings of uh, both the president and the ruling party start to slip. Just briefly uh, go through two other points and then we can pick up other, other um, ideas in the Q&A. Uh, the third point is the notion of a liberal democracy. Um, uh, Schmidt makes much of the idea that although he's anti-liberal, he's not anti-democratic, right? His idea indeed of authoritarianism, of modern, a new type of authoritarianism is one that can be constructed in an era of mass politics, right? Of, of democratic politics in, in his very limited sense of what that means. And again, we can see this reflected in the ideas, particularly uh, Vladislav Surkov's ideas of sovereign democracy and these sort of models of, of democracy a la Rus, if you like, that, uh, that emerge in the 2000s um, and have now become essentially cemented in the new constitution. And their ultimate culmination, I suggest, was in the referendum this year in June. Um, uh, a referendum which had no legal status, was not even a referendum, uh, you'll remind me, um, but nevertheless was a kind of Schmittian vote of affirmation in a leader and in the ideas of a leader um, that uh, is the kind of democratic process that Schmidt thought was appropriate in a, uh, in a sustainable authoritarian state. So that explains to a certain extent the uh, uh, the obsession almost with in the Putin regime with public opinion, with trying to mold public opinion through uh, control of media, control of narratives and so forth. Uh, that's been a really important part, I think, of Putinism is it doesn't disconnect from uh, the population. It tries to shape that relationship uh, with society in very particular ways. And again, we can talk about why this is similar to other types of emerging um, what I would call Schmittian politics. Um, in eastern parts of Eastern Europe, for example, uh, in Hungary, perhaps in Turkey, in other parts of the world where um, uh, electoral politics uh, goes alongside the rise of more authoritarian practices, and those two things are not necessarily um, in opposition. So a liberal democracy is, is Schmittian democracy, really, um, and uh, the role of uh, the population in this is a really important part of understanding uh, that relationship between the leader and the uh, and the political system. And then finally, just the fourth point um, um, is to try and understand Schmidt's uh, international relations theory. Uh, and here I have a couple of chapters in the book, um, both on his idea of what the world should look like, and also his idea of a rather messianic idea that um, has also been reflected in Russian foreign policy 
uh, in recent years. Just to focus on the first aspect, the notion of international order, um, Schmidt argues against pluralism within the state, right? He argues that pluralism undermines the state and undermines a political order, but argues for pluralism between states. His main um, uh, argument for saying that is really an anti-liberal argument. He argues against a, uh, what he sees as a US foreign policy that is universalist. Schmidt is a great anti-universalist. Um, and uh, looks for space and um, uh, looks for spaces within which uh, different countries and different civilizations can achieve their own political ideas and their own norms. For Schmidt, the ideal international order is one based on the Monroe Doctrine. He sees the Monroe, Monroe, Monroe Doctrine as uh, the, the, uh, the basis for a new kind of multipolarity. And of course, Monroe has also been cited uh, by Russian conservatives as exactly the kind of sphere of influence that they would like to see in their neighborhood as well. Hence, when Russian uh, thinkers talk about multipolarity, it's a multipolarity of spheres of influence, importantly, um, and of the ability to carve out a space within the international order uh, that is not defined by liberal ideas and by universal ideas. We've seen that coming out even this year, um, various speeches by Russian officials um, uh, decrying the idea of universal values and asserting instead a sort of Russian civilization alternative uh, of more conservative values, of more uh, conservative political ideas, and suggesting that uh, those should take precedence over any kind of universalism. So there's a lot more to that discussion, of course, but it does have profound consequences for how we understand Russia's relationship, uh, Russia's relationship with this near abroad, and also how Russia views uh, what we call, or what many of us perhaps still call, the liberal international order, right? Uh, and the, the different narratives uh, that promote um, uh, liberal internationalism uh, seen in the West and how those are seen, of course, in Moscow among Russian conservatives as essentially an attack on uh, the existence of a Russian alternative uh, and of a Russian civilization. So these four big ideas that Schmidt uh, promotes uh, are interpreted in all sorts of ways by Russian conservatives, but they have a huge affinity with the way that Russian thinking about authoritarianism developed over the last uh, two decades and have produced a kind of political order, I think, in Russia that is certainly authoritarian, but is authoritarian in quite new and interesting ways uh, and in ways that um, perhaps in some ways are even more challenging than simply the idea of Russia as a failed democracy in that they have some traction internationally, talked already about the, uh, uh, the extent to which Putinism has various mirrors in different countries around the region. Um, and many aspects of this anti-liberal ideology are those that also resonate with, um, with political movements and political groups uh, in Europe, in South Asia and elsewhere. This move towards majoritarian democracy as a basis for, uh, for a new kind of illiberal uh, order, I think we can also see uh, in many countries around the world. So Putinism, I think, should be taken in that big international context. We should understand it as an authoritarian system uh, that is not just about Russian history, but is also about the resonance of Russia with uh, the rest of the world, and that the basis of it really is a pushback against liberal ideas and liberal politics. Uh, President Putin last year told us that liberalism is obsolete, uh, and I think that's a genuine belief among many in the Russian uh, political elite uh, that they are moving on into a post-liberal political order uh, and that Russia will be central to shaping what that post-liberal uh, political and international order will look like. So I'll uh, leave it there. Sorry, I went on a little long, but uh, hopefully there's still time for Q&A. Thanks so much, David. Uh, it was a fascinating talk and definitely sparked a lot of questions. I'll use the chair's prerogative to come get things going and then we can turn it right over to the audience who have been submitting questions. And I encourage everyone to please either chat me up or put it in the Q&A and we'll pass on those questions. So I appreciated the critique of kind of a political economy or institutional approach to explaining Russian politics, but I wanted to kind of push back a little bit and, and ask for some examples where ideology, ideology went beyond just justifying rule and power. I mean, I think some 
scholars are quite skeptical of the role of ideas in Russian politics because you oftentimes the ideas are used to rationalize and to to preserve the dictatorship that's been built and oftentimes provide public cover for a lot of the very unpopular or even illegal actions that the regime has been undertaken in the last 20 years, especially when it comes to wealth accumulation and stuff. So if we're going to move beyond a, a rational choice framework, it would be interesting to have examples where the regime acted irrationally and pursued ideas over its own sense of self-preservation, over its own and, and even jeopardized or undermined its, its hold on power in order to pursue the conservatism that you think is really undergirding, undergirding and shaping the worldview. Now, I think personally, there might be more examples in foreign policy than there are in domestic policy, the regime taking risks that actually it cared so much of ideas that it put it all on the line and that it, it, it maybe, Maybe those are to come by, but I'm curious your thoughts so that we can really place ideas in opposition, which is ideology is very hollow. It doesn't really explain necessarily the redistributive impulse and a lot of the economic policy on the on the domestic front. And that, you know, Putin still really cares about winning elections, hasn't canceled elections. And ideology is a way of separating friend from foe to make sure that there's a minimum winning coalition and they can stay in power as long as possible. So. That's my short question, and then I will turn it over to all the audience once you once you finish with that. Yeah, thanks. Great question, David. Um, obviously, there's a whole another whole book to be written on that. Um, I think it. Uh, so I, again, I I think it's a very valid question. I think it presupposes a particular understanding of ideology and ideas, right? That ideas is a sort of uh, things you have in a box um, that you are trying to defend through certain policies. Um, and as you say, you'll take certain actions to defend your ideas. Um, that's not how I see things happening, really. I think there's, they're more of a lens through which you see the world that make you act in particular ways, right? So, um, you know, the obvious example in all this, of course, I think, is the annexation of Crimea, which makes very little sense, uh, I think, in terms of rational um, actor um, or personal financial gain, for example, for the elite. Um, the idea that uh, you annex a piece of territory uh, simply to gain more popularity at home, I think they um, certainly had that effect in short term, but um, in the long term, of course, it has not had that effect. And I think it seems to me that that sort of, that sort of decision made um, in a very short period of time can only happen through a set of ideas that are already pre-existing, right? Which are about uh, what the West intends to do in Ukraine, um, what the Russian state should be able to do in response to that, uh, what is the appropriate action, right, that we would understand through the set of ideas through which we see the world. So it's not as though saying, yeah, we believe in conservatism, we're going to defend it, but I don't think that's how it works. I think it's simply um, a prism through which you interpret the world and through which you respond to it. Um, and that's how I understand ideology. It's a very, um, it's not a sort of codified uh, written text in the way that Marxism was, it's a way of viewing the world that makes you act um, in ways uh, that you wouldn't otherwise do. I think in domestic politics, um, you know, I do think a lot of the uh, the changes we've seen in the last year, even uh, the constitutional changes, certainly bear the imprint, of course, of this kind of conservative thinking about the future, uh, and this move from um, from paying at least of lip service to to sort of the form of democracy to a much more of what I would see anyway as a kind of Schmittian authoritarianism, uh, this idea um, that Vladislav Surkov uh, has often talked about of, of the leader and the people being uh, in contact without these sort of intermediary uh, institutions. And I think all those amendments to the Constitution, uh, many of them, of course, reflect conservative values in a very specific way. I think pulled together, they look like an important conservative worldview that is moving the Russian political debate on from uh, the old days of, sort of uh, liberalism versus conservatism to a new to a new sort of discourse around what politics should look like going forward. So I, I, I yeah. So I, I would say that you know the attempt. I'm not trying to put ideas into a rational actor framework, say where you can take your set of ideas and uh, uh, and pursue certain policies in defence of them. Uh, I think that would be a mistake. 
I think just to add to that, you know, the idea Russia is not defending an ideology uh, specifically of things like um, you know, traditional family values, et cetera, et cetera. It does do that, but that is not its uh, primary focus in international relations. Uh, these simply inform the way it views the world, uh, and it's, a, it's much more pragmatic about how it uses those in actuality, I think, um, because it, um, it, you know, as with any ideology, you have a menu of things that you can pick from and you can be a little bit selective. So maybe, you know, we, there's a certain different way of understanding ideology, but I suggest what we're really trying to understand is the sort of cognitive behavior of elites and how they understand and interpret events and how they therefore justify their policy responses as well. Great, thank you very much. Now let's uh, turn it over to the audience. I'm gonna take the questions more or less in the order that they were received. From Boris Yagodayev, does Russian conservative the Russian desire to reconcile the history of the czars and what many view as the crime done by the communists by disposing of them? Sorry, could you just repeat the sure. first question? Does Russian conservatism solve the Russian desire to reconcile the history of the czars and what many view as the crime done by the communists by disposing of them? So kind of reversion. Right, but I think it's an interesting, uh, interesting question. I'll answer in a slightly roundabout way, uh, simply by saying that one of the interesting things I think about Russian conservatism is that it doesn't really have this strong linear connection to uh, Russian conservative thinking in the uh, in the 19th and 20th century in some ways. Obviously, that is an inspiration, um, um, including some of the uh, Russian conservative thinkers in in exile, um, like Ilin and others. But I think the interesting thing about this uh, new conservatism is how much it appeals to non-Russian sources, um, and particularly, of course, the thinkers of uh, German uh, illiberal thinking and German German uh, conservative thinking of the 1920s and 1930s. I think that that attempt to, uh, someone said, think through Russian problems with German philosophy is quite a strong tradition, of course, in Russia. Uh, but I think it does uh, raise some very interesting questions um, because there is an alternative strand, of course, of Russian conservatism that is really an orthodox Russian conservatism uh, that is not very interested in uh, in sort of Duginian geopolitics. It's not very interested in uh, in the sort of Schmittian uh, tradition either, and goes much much deeper into uh, Tsarist history for its inspiration. But that, to my mind, has not been particularly influential in political terms, um, although its advocates are, of course. Um, out there, and people like Konstantin Malafeyev maybe promote this idea to some extent. Um, but I do think that is one of the problems of Russian conservatism as, a, as if you like, a solution to Russia's intellectual problems, is that it is not particularly well connected to, uh, to Tsarist history or to, or to the problems of this, you know, the, the sort of conceptual problem of what, what you think about the Soviet regime, right? Um, it doesn't really seem to me to have a strong um, take on what 1917 meant, sort of absence of debate around the revolution uh, in, uh, on the 100th anniversary recently, um, and also a rather mixed opinion on what the Soviet Union meant for, um, for uh, Russia today. Of course, you know, Russian conservatism of this type doesn't accept you know, 1991 as the sort of new start for Russia, instead sees that as part of a period of chaos of time of troubles that goes from 1985 through to 2000. That's its understanding of Russian history. But that still doesn't solve the problem of what you do about uh, the Soviet period. And I think that is a weakness, frankly, uh, in current, current debates in Russian conservatism. But others may have different views. But I think, I think that that difficulty of establishing continuity with a tradition of Russian conservative thought uh, through the 18th and 19th centuries and 20th century um, is a challenge. And that's why Schmidt and other uh, external influencers have come in to try and influence that debate uh, within Russian conservatism today. It's partly a problem simply of how to adapt conservatism to a period of history which is dominated by liberal thinking. Uh, and perhaps the Russian conservative tradition uh, has not always been 
strong enough to deal with that. Great. Um, from Grace Keir, when creating the division between friends and enemies, do Schmidt and Russian conservatives ever distinguish between internal enemies, i.e. LGBTQ activists, and external, i.e. the West? Or is it all nominally connected through the fifth column? So a question about Schmidt and internal versus external enemies or a distinction and potentially some theoretical importance of the two groups. Um, yes, there's, there is that distinction, but it's one that's implicit in your question. In other words, uh, the fifth column theory makes the distinction. In other words, all internal enemies, um, yeah, I think, uh, say all internal enemies are in some way linked to the great external enemy, if you like. Uh, otherwise, there's no logic to it. The whole point of it is that the internal enemy doesn't exist um, on their own. Otherwise, that means you've got a split in your political community, right? The, the logic is that the internal enemy is one that is linked to an external enemy that can do you great harm and in, indeed is your, your existential other, right? And that's why you know, there's always this linkage made in Russian narratives around opposition that they're somehow linked to uh, to the West, even when that's um, uh, rather incredible. We've seen it in Russian narratives around Belarus this year, for example. Um, we've seen it in narratives last year about the Moscow protests, trying to paint those as somehow uh, the creation of the West. But what's interesting, of course, has been the declining credibility of that narrative among Russian publics. I think that. Uh, the traction of that uh, sort of fifth columnism um, has started to fade uh, as people see, um, you know, in a way, Russian is a, a sort of a victim of its own success by uh, by limiting the international support for civil society, by limiting um, the connections through foreign agent legislation and so on and so forth, it's becoming more and more difficult to say this is all the work of uh, the CIA or the West or the European Union. Um, and um, although, again, we see efforts in the Duma to put forward new legislation, I think that the public understanding of this um, it has been changing over the last few years. So the the traction of this friend-enemy uh, discourse is one that is quite hard to maintain unless you're really prepared to keep going down this uh, track of increasing repressions uh, and increasing divisions within society. And I think... Um, it's one of the challenges of, it's one of the logics of Schmittian politics, right? Is that once you start on friend enemy, you can't really stop because there's always another division to be made going forward. Um, and we've seen that in Russia, but I think there's also an understanding in the elite that there's a limit to how far they can go in that way. Uh, and I think we're seeing that limit reached uh, already. Great. Kind of piggybacking on this theme of opposition from Paul Shelp, has Putin actually succeeded in tarring Alexei Navalny as a beyond the pale outsider? And how much pressure is Navalny applying to the regime? And will the regime need to respond to that pressure by changing anything? Presumably, the ideology is meant here as well. Uh, yeah, again, good question. I think um, Navalny is a very good example of this uh, construction of the opposition as the outsider, as the fifth column. We've already seen attempts to link, uh, you know, by by Navalny being in the West in a way, to a certain extent, that's become perhaps easier to link him to Western sources. Um, but we've also seen during this period, if public opinion polls are to be believed, um, some increase in uh, at least trust in Navalny, I mean, from low levels, to be fair, um, and so it doesn't seem to me, again, that that narrative is particularly potent anymore in Russian society. Um, presumably those people who always believed Navalny was, was a foreign agent will continue to do so. Um, but, I, but I'm not sure that is really uh, grabbing public attention the way perhaps it might have done uh, a few years ago. Um, so I think you know, that narrative will continue of trying to put people into that box of uh, these are people linked to external forces trying to do Russia harm. Uh, I don't think that narrative will change, but I'm not convinced that it still has the same resonance as it used to, perhaps, uh, in Russian society today. Next up from Hugo Klein. 
Aren't all great powers by nature sovereign exceptionalists in that they don't necessarily abide by the international rules? Or is this specific to autocracy or authoritarian regime? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, uh, the, uh, the short answer is probably historically yes. Um, you know, one of the uh, there's no doubt that you know, looking uh, Mikhail Zigar's book on the Russian uh, Russian elite makes this point, uh, and if it's apocryphal or not, that 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 Putin really saw uh, George Bush as the ultimate uh, sovereign power, right? That a figure in politics who could make and break rules in the early 2000s when the United States was at the height of its international power, um, and that moment I think uh, sort of encouraged Russia to think through its own understanding of its sovereign uh, decision-making in international relations. So, yeah, I think there's some truth to that. But I think, of course, um, Russia has taken this to uh, perhaps a new level. Uh, this understanding of sovereignty is one that really sees the current international order as one that constrains any, any possibility of Russia of achieving that sovereignty. So it becomes quite a revisionist form of sovereignty. Um, and one, of course, uh, that also impinges uh, hugely on the sovereignty of other states, right? And this is one of the paradoxes of great power understandings of sovereignty is that uh, it's, all, it's all very well for great powers to be sovereign, uh, but not for uh, their neighbors and other smaller states. There's very much this differential understanding of sovereignty, uh, which is different for great powers uh, than for uh, smaller powers. So, yeah, I agree there's lots to that, but I think because uh, you're in an authoritarian state, where you have this singular mode of decision making, and because you have an elite that is not particularly interested in more integration into multilateral organizations, more integration into international forms of governance, uh, that is not really accepting of current norms of global governance and universal ideas of human rights, for example, you get a much stronger um, and, uh, and uh, more destructive in some ways form of sovereignty assertion uh, than you do from other great powers within the system. Um, I'm sure others on the on the Q&A could do a good comparison with uh, with Chinese understandings of sovereignty. Um, I think there's much to work on there. But clearly, all this sort of sovereignty assertion is against a particular understanding of liberal international order uh, that many states find uh, very difficult to deal with um, and, um, and, and have not managed to integrate themselves within the international order for a whole host of reasons that we could go into. So, yeah, I think there's a lot to that, um, but Russia's understanding of, uh, of sovereignty and its willingness to break the rules, I think, has been um, uh, a little more extreme, perhaps, than we would see historically from other great powers. Thank you. Fennel, could you elaborate on the silent majority's relationship to theology? To Schmidt, sorry, I missed the last ideology to Schmitt's idea yeah yes yeah, so uh so in a way this comes comes back to uh schmidt's understanding of uh democracy which is very specific you know, the idea of political community and democracy really which is about uh, forming a kind of homogeneous um community um it doesn't have to be one based on ethnicity but uh, essentially a group of people who all think roughly in the same way and that way of thinking is defined by their attitude to to the other, to the enemy, right? But in most cases, of course, um, the natural sort of pull around that unity is formed is around nationalism or ethnic uh, belonging, and that's why uh, you know you have to remember Schmidt is talking about this in the 1930s in Germany, and that's why um, his uh, his rather urbane discussion of this. You can't forget what what is actually happening at the same time um, in Germany, and which he himself is participating in, right, in the persecution of the Jews. So there's a, there's very very clear um, uh, aspect in which the silent majority for Schmidt is this political unity of people of the mass, if you like, which is which is in concord with the leader. Uh, uh, and the silent majority is one uh, which has to fight against. Uh, minorities that are linked to external powers, for example. Um, and you see that again in the construction of the majority in Russia, uh, where the, the enemies of that majority are also all these groups that are, that are linked to international liberalism that are seen as somehow undermining the Russian state, 
uh, but also under undermining the Russian way of life as it's constructed in their thinking, uh, Russian norms, Russian ideas, um, um, Russian, you know, Russian identity essentially uh, is challenged in this kind of way. So the silent majority um, uh, is uh, is one that is given voice by a leader, and that's an important aspect to it. Is the connection between the sort of emotional connection between the silent majority um, and the leader who who articulates what they really think. Um, he doesn't necessarily uh, ask them, but he thinks he knows what they think. And lots of Schmidt um, has very interesting ideas about about how you shape this this popular will. Right, uh, Schmidt is very very modern in, in his understanding that uh, you need modern forms of media, modern forms of technology to shape the way that people think. To ensure, of course, that this silent majority um, remains silent, but uh, still thinks the way that you want them to think. So it's not as though he's giving voice to this majority as a kind of subject of politics. Uh, he's taking this majority and using them as the base, as the popular base for this leader who represents them in all sorts of ways, right? As their voice, as their political protector, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's been a big, a big part of Russian conservative thinking is reconstructing that. But as I say, there are very interesting affinities there with American conservative thought also over the last uh, last three decades, which uh, Russian conservatives, of course, have also uh, studied quite closely. So from Garrett Campbell, you have just mentioned Ivan Illin. Uh, there's been selective use of his ideas and actual statements on part of various regime elites. How impactful is he on Russian elites, and how much do his ideas permeate their world views? Uh, yeah, really good question. Um, recommend Marlene Larelle's piece on this uh, this question. Um, Timothy Snyder, of course, wrote a whole book about Ivan Illin's uh, influence on Russian political thinking. My own view is that it's it's in reality a little bit marginal. I mean, obviously, he's one of several um, several thinkers that have influenced Russian political debate. Um, he's one who um, has it has absorbed also some of that interwar conservative thinking um, from German sources as well. Because of course, he was in exile during that period, uh, and that has been another channel for those ideas to feed back into uh, Russia itself. And of course, he has quite interesting overlaps with Schmidt in various ways um, in his understanding of what authoritarianism might look like. Uh, but I, but I think we have to be quite careful of this um, this idea where we pick a few quotes that crop up in speeches and try to interpret that as the uh, the sort of line of influence of particular philosophers. I said before we have to be very careful about saying this is the philosopher that Putin reads or this is the uh, the ideologue of the regime. Um, these are quotes that may at various points um, have become influ influential. Some of his work certainly has been influential in parts of the Russian elite, but I don't see him as a holistic thinker who provides any kind of real political framework uh, for thinking in the contemporary world. Um, and I, I also think his his philosophy is is quite narrowly focused on a small number of aspects related to um, related to the domestic politics of Russia. So I don't think he has that international scope that perhaps others have. But again, I'd emphasize what we're looking for here really is the influences on a world view. Ilin is certainly one of those, uh, but I don't think he's the most important. Um, and I think some of the work has rather exaggerated his influence. I take that. And our last question, because we're almost running out of time. How do you see the, oh, from Nicole Jackson. How do you see the ideas that you discussed as fitting into the fundamentalist nationalism strand of thinking that we used to use in describing Russian foreign policy and the move over time from pragmatic nationalism to fundamentalist nationalism by Margot Light and others? The ideas you discussed all fit into that kind of explanation of the, ex of the importance of ideas. Uh, yeah, thanks, Nicole. Very good question. Um, so I think to some extent, um, I mean, nationalism, of course, is, is a useful framework to think about part of this. But I think it doesn't quite capture the nature of Russian 
geopolitical thinking. Um, you know, obviously, we've had these interesting discussions around different types of nationalism in Russian thinking, between ethnic nationalism and a kind of imperial nationalism, which I think perhaps has been uh, more resonant with the Russian elite. I think the usefulness of uh, Schmidt's geopolitics, and uh, which has fed through a lot into this sort of Russian school of geopolitics, which is so popular in, uh, you know, you see it in every Russian bookshop, um, not so popular with academics, but certainly in sort of populist thinking about foreign policy. I think that that view of geopolitics is much less about nationalism, and much more about space, of geopolitical space, right? And that goes back to uh, a previous question, really, about, about what great powers do in the international order. Um, uh, and this suggests that although, obviously, nationalism has been one of the drivers of Russian foreign policy in the near abroad, it's not been the only one. Um, and, of course, we've seen various nationalist projects uh, collapse, uh, Novorossiya being the obvious one in Ukraine. Um, we've seen uh, some reluctance, I think, from the Russian leadership to go too far down that avenue um, of uh, fully nationalist foreign policy and much more of an emphasis, emphasis on the importance of geopolitical space around Russia and creating uh, what they see as buffer zones of the West or a space within Russia can exert its own influence. And again, I think, you know, uh, nationalism uh, to a certain extent is useful in, um, in thinking about Russian relations with the near abroad. I think it struggles in some ways to uh, understand, for example, the Russian intervention in Syria, uh, Russian moves around the Eastern Mediterranean and so forth. Um, I think the broader geopolitical thinking um, that Schmidt brings to bear is quite useful in understanding how he thinks great powers should react to a, um, a dominant liberal international order. In other words, how do powers carve out space for themselves within an order that they see as essentially antagonistic towards them? Um, Part of that is about nationalism, but I think it's also about dealing with an international system uh, that you see as essentially um, uh, predicated on, on you being a second, second order power. And I think that is the real driver for Russia, is about asserting itself as one of the major powers and influences in international politics um, and being a decision maker at the top table uh, alongside China and the United States, one of the three major powers that will decide a post-liberal international order. Um, I think that's the real driver. Uh, nationalism is part of that, but it's not as not as explanatory, I think, as this broader sort of geopolitical thinking. I think is quite uh, quite dominant still uh, in Moscow today. Uh, very much. studies first one this event go by his book russia's new authoritarianism putin and the politics of order and thank you very much for joining us for such an enlightening conversation we hope to see you at many more future events um, coming in the next couple months thanks thanks david and thanks for everyone's insights